life is an unimaginable feeling. The darkness is unending, but so close it blurs the lines between your body and the earth surrounding it. Breathing becomes shallow. Reality sets in. This may be the end. It will take a miracle to break free out from under this weight. This is Buried Alive. One of the greatest fears in the 17 and 1800s was that of being buried alive. There's many accounts of this happening. In the 1700s, there was a woman by the name of Alice Blunden who drank too much poppy seed tea. It put her into a coma and doctors mistakenly pronounced her dead. It wasn't until children nearby were playing by her gravesite that they heard screaming and later dug her up. In 1884, there was a woman by the name of Anna Hochwalt who was declared dead. The family was suspicious of the doctor's diagnosis and it wasn't until they dug her up when they discovered the horrifying truth. Her body had been turned over and they found nail marks on the inside of the coffin. In 1937, there was a man by the name of Angelo Hayes who suffered a motorcycle accident and was pronounced dead at the scene. He was buried for three days. They didn't get to do an autopsy of the body, so they exhumed the body only to discover that the body was still warm. He wasn't dead, he was in a coma and would go on to live for another 50 years. Buried alive, it's a terrifying concept. And although not literal, I do want to look at and maybe identify how maybe in our minds, emotionally or spiritually, we feel buried alive. Right? That's a question. What do you do when you feel stuck in life? Finding that hope might look like it's over. What do you do when you think it's over for you? Mark chapter 5 and verse 22, the Bible says that when Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was there by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came up to Jesus, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet, and he pleaded earnestly with him. He said, my little daughter is dying. Please, if you could come lay hands on her, she will be healed, and she'll live. So Jesus goes with him, and the Bible says that a large crowd began to gather around him and pressed all around him. And if you jump down just a few verses in Mark 5:35 says that while Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus to the synagogue leader and said, sir, your daughter is dead. No longer dying, she's dead. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus tells him, don't be afraid, just believe. Interesting response that this man just experiences the death of his daughter, and in this situation, Jesus tells him, don't be afraid. See, fear is one of the most basic human emotions. From the time you and I are born, we're born with only two fears, the fear of falling and the fear of loud noises. Any fear that you have beyond that is learned. They're learned responses, either from experiences that you've had or from information that you've gained throughout the years. By definition, Fear is the belief that someone or something is dangerous, or it's the anticipation of pain, danger, or threat. Fear can be healthy, right? You can have healthy fears when you're about to cross the street and you look both ways. That's a healthy fear to have. But fear can also be unhealthy. Like so much so, you feel the inability to even interact with other people in social settings. I saw a video of this play out when it was a focus study they had taken the parents of a young baby and they placed them in a separate room and they placed the baby in another controlled room and next to the baby, they put a python snake. And the parents have your reaction just like you and I would. They're mortified, they're panicking, but the baby's fine. Baby's ooing and eyeing and picking up the snake, petting the snake. The baby has no learned fear. The, the, the baby has no experience or information as to why a snake should be something that's feared. I mean, the same is true for you and I. Introduce enough negative experiences, introduce enough negative painful circumstances, new fears develop. Fear left unchecked 
can have a hold on you, can have a death grip on you, it can cause you to second guess every decision you ever make, maybe even make you feel paralyzed. Fear can cause you to feel despair, like there's no escape, feeling completely suffocated. One thing is for certain, look, I don't know many of you in this room or watching online right now. I don't know each and every one of your stories, but one thing I can say with confidence is that each and every person under the sound of my voice has at one time or another experienced or endured pain. It's a fact of life. Maybe you've been let down. You thought life would look one way and it's turned out the complete opposite way that you ever expected. And because of these painful events, you've maybe developed a worldview or a particular way of thinking and you live in this place of always believing and anticipating and expecting the worst case scenarios. It's okay, it's just the smoke. It is okay. It's just the smoke from the little grave thing. You think the grave thing is cool? It did that, so we're okay, we're safe. Praise God, they're telling me we're good. I love whenever God's about to do something, the enemy will send a distraction, every time. Not today, devil, you lose. If you're here, and you'd say, Luke, you're describing me. I feel like I always live in worst case scenarios and expect worst case scenarios. You live under the grip of fear. As we see in that first scripture we just read, fear and death are closely related. This man approaches Jesus. He's just experienced the death. Well, first he says, Jesus, my daughter is sick. She's dying. Please come help her so that she might live. While they're working their way through the crowd, Jesus actually stops to heal another woman. And while this is happening, that's when those other people come up and say, sir, your daughter's no longer dying, she's dead. I can't imagine what he'd be facing. What questions would be swirling around his mind? Jesus, if you hadn't have stopped, my daughter would still be alive. Why did you let this happen? God, if only you would have, or if only you could have. Has anybody ever been there before? I know I have many times. That's not this man's response, and that's not what Jesus says to him. In fact, Jesus' response is so interesting. He experiences death, and he says, don't be afraid, just believe. See, Jesus responds by speaking to his fear. Fear and death, like I said, are closely related. And many times, what we see as an end, as a grave, as final, God sees very differently. You and I have to go beyond what we just see, and you have to ask yourself, what do you believe? Not what do you see, but what do you believe? It's not a question of what's in front of you. It's what do you think and what do you believe? Because fear is believing the worst case scenario. It's believing in the worst possible outcome, but faith is believing in the best possible outcome. Jesus continues, and he says, and he goes, and he says, why all this commotion? Why all the wailing? The girl's not dead, she's only asleep. See, what they saw as dead, Jesus saw as an opportunity for a miracle. What you see as dead or final or no way out because of what you've experienced, because of the information, you feel stuck, you feel trapped, you might feel buried alive. The enemy would love for you and I to think that the grave is final, that there's no way out, that you'll always be or you'll never be, that this is the end. But I wanna help you tonight through the power of God's word, help you see it's not over for you. But the problem occurs when we face death while we're still living. I feel stuck and trapped, but I still have breath. Jesus says there's still life in you. It's not a question of what do you see. The question tonight is what do you think? What will you believe? Proverbs 23 verse 7 says, as a man thinks in his heart, so he is. What you believe will determine your reality. And I want to help you walk through some graves tonight that the enemy would love nothing more than for you to believe are final. So why don't we turn our attention to the screen and quietly take a look at this next grave.
This wasn't how it was supposed to go. I feel like I'm drifting endlessly. Once I had direction and meaning, but now there's only uncertainty and emptiness. Ambition has faded and motivation has evaporated. Each day blends into the next. I spend my time searching for something, anything, to anchor my thoughts and actions to, but I find nothing but disappointment. The vibrant colors of life have faded to dull shades. I'm burdened with questions, longing for answers, and desperate for guidance. Why am I even here? Maybe there's no purpose at all. Maybe for you, you would say, here lies my purpose. Here lies my faith in the future. Maybe when you were younger, you had the belief that life would turn out a particular way and now because of hurt, because of disappointment and failure, you've given up. You're no longer somebody who even just feels like you've failed, but you've failed so many times, you yourself feel like you're a failure. Maybe you remember the dreams that you had when you were a kid, aspirations you had when you were younger. Maybe you can even think back to a time where you were close to God, but you've walked away and you've turned your back on church and God. Proverbs 29, 18 tells us that where there's no vision, the people perish. Do you catch that? Without purpose, it can feel like a death, death of motivation, death of why am I even here? Why even try? Maybe that's where you're at. You're in a place of asking yourself, why is this happening to me? How did I get here? This is nothing like I thought it would look like. Why am I having setback after setback? It's always going to be this way. I can never seem to break free of where I'm at. My prayer is that tonight you'll leave here saying, I still have a purpose. But you have to look beyond what you can see right now. I know it looks bad for now. I know it feels bad and it hurts for now. I think a lot of times when we talk about how bad our lives are and what we're going through, we need to add a for now to the end of that statement. I'm struggling for now. I'm hurting for now. I'm in pain for now. You know, many times when producers are making films, they go and they shoot the final scene of the movie first. And then they'll go all the way back to the beginning and then they'll shoot the first scene and all the scenes throughout, all the good scenes, all the bad scenes. And it's okay because the entire time they're shooting and working on the film, they know how the story ends. That's why you can't get upset in the middle of a movie. When you see Rocky go down in the fifth round, it's okay because we know how the movie ends. Come on, somebody. That's why you can't get upset in life when you just look at a moment, at a scene in your life. The same is true for you. I know they left you. I know it's difficult. I know it hurts right now, but that's not how your story ends. There's still life. There's an author and a finisher of your faith. So don't allow the temporary moments in life to steal what God wants to do for the rest of your life. Let's take a look at this next grave. I feel like this is the end for me. I'm in a void. Where at one time, the light of possibilities illuminated my life but that's now faded into darkness. As I look ahead to the bleak, unchanging future, there's a heavy weight pressing down on my chest, making it difficult to breathe. Each day is stripped of enthusiasm as hope dissolves into despair. My mind is a whirlwind, filled with anxiety, unresolved conflicts, and reruns of my mistakes. The sense of safety is long gone and is replaced with unease in every decision and step. I reach out for peace, but feel trapped in a cycle of restlessness and isolation. I failed again. Maybe this is just who I am. Trapped, hopeless, and unable to break free. Maybe for you, you would say, here lies my hope. Feeling completely and utterly hopeless. Anxiety and fear weighing you down. 
I found that anxiety and fear are really just imagining a future completely void of hope. It takes a lot of creativity to imagine a future without any hope. Now more than ever, we need to guard and protect our minds and our thought life. It was sobering reading an article that said that 32% of teens this past year were diagnosed with an anxiety disorder. That 42% of teens and young adults reported higher levels and struggles with depression. 31% of them reported even higher levels of stress. And in 2022 alone, it was the highest reported year of teen suicide with over 800,000 in America. If you don't protect your mind, your thoughts, you'll feel defeated constantly. Anxiety, insecurity, worry, stress, addiction, regret, shame, they're all attacks on your mind to pull you down and get you to bury any shred of hope that you'd have left. But I just need a young person to understand today that the only thing standing between this grave and your mind is Jesus Christ. In Luke chapter seven, there was a young boy who had passed away. The crowd is carrying his coffin, carrying his dead body on their way to his gravesite. His mother, a widow, now her final child has passed away. They're on their way to the gravesite. And on their way, Jesus and his disciples encounter these, this group of mourners. And in this interaction, Jesus does something strange. He touches the coffin of the young boy. He says to him, young man, arise. And the boy that was dead was raised back to life. Now, this is very interesting. In this day and age, it's a peculiar custom, I know. But if the last male had died in a family, which is the case in this instance, what would happen is the community would be able to go into that person's home and take all of the clothes, all of the shoes, any garments belonging to that individual. Clothes were very valuable, very sought after. You couldn't just go down to Abercrombie and get you a shirt or a jacket. And because clothes were so rare in this day and age, it would be common for people to go into a person's home that had just passed away and wear that person's clothes to that person's funeral. It's a bit odd. So this boy, he's now risen back to life and he sits up and I was just thinking, what would this young man say? What would be the first thing he would say? He gets up and I imagine he would look around at the crowd and he'd say, you're wearing my coat. Give me my coat back. Those are my J's, quit creasing them, give those back. Those are my pants, those are my shoes, give those back to me. Because when Jesus touches your coffin, the enemy has to give back whatever it is that he's stolen. And in this instance, that young boy got his life back and got his belongings back. But when Jesus touches that which is holding you, you get to rise up and say, devil, give me back my hope. Give me back my joy. Give me back my peace. Give me back my health. I still have breath in my lungs. The enemy wants you in that grave. He wants you defeated. He wants you hopeless. He wants you anxious. He wants you depressed. But I need to tell somebody, when Jesus walks by your grave, hope, joy, and peace are restored. The enemy wants you to believe that the grave is final. But I'm so grateful we serve a God who meets us where we're at. Let's continue and look at this next grave. How many times do I have to trust someone? Only to learn a lesson that I can't trust anybody. I'm overwhelmed with an unshakable bitterness that covers every thought and interaction. Every day is filled with moments that trigger frustration, anger, and disappointment. Relationships are broken, trust is gone, and cynicism has taken root. I feel so hollow and completely alone. 
Joy is a distant thought, and the weight of bitterness makes even simple tasks feel intimidating. I'm on my own. I can't trust anyone. I don't think I can truly love anyone. How could I ever love someone when I can't even love myself? Perhaps you'd look at your life and you would say, here lies love. Here lies any love I have for life, any love I have for anybody else. And honestly, if you're being true to yourself, here lies any love I'd ever have for me. Maybe you're dealing with unforgiveness, grief, bitterness, loss, hurt, or anger. See, I don't think I've ever met an angry person who wasn't truly just hurt. Because if you could be honest, it's a whole lot easier to hate than it is to heal. Than to admit there's some hurt that you need to deal with, but it's eating you alive. See, you think you're holding on to unforgiveness because what they did was so wrong and you could never forgive them. You're holding on to that bitterness. You're holding on to that anger. That's what you think, but really it's holding on to you and it's dragging you down six feet under. I don't know which grave you're experiencing today. I don't know where you'd find yourself. Maybe it's something that I've mentioned or maybe you would feel through this message it's something weighing on your heart but you know it's suffocating you, weighing you down. You think it's final. Your thought is that it's over, that you've gone too far. Or maybe you even look at the choices you made in your life and you'd say, Luke, I probably deserve to be here. Like I've messed up big time. I deserve to feel like this. I deserve the guilt. I deserve this shame. I deserve to be here. Wherever you find yourself, I need to tell you, there's no grave too deep that God cannot rescue you from. Jesus speaks just a few words to this little girl, and what was dead is restored back to life. He says in verse 41, little girl, he takes her by the hand. He says, Talitha kum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. What others saw as dead, whatever, what, what others thought as dead, believed as over, Jesus saw as an opportunity for the miraculous. All it takes is one word, one moment from God, and everything can change. The enemy would want you to believe and would want nothing more than for you to live in fear, be angry, be bitter. Live hopeless, live depressed, live anxious, live addicted, live feeling regret and shame like you're a failure. Believe that you're too far gone. That's what the devil wants you to think. The devil wants your life to be over, to be meaningless, to end. When the truth is, if you ever find yourself purposeless or hopeless or wherever you're at in life, we serve a God who still empties graves of their inhabitants. Everything around us can fail, but God will never fail you. I love how Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 13, 13, these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Can I just tell you tonight, the simple truth of why we're doing this whole event, of why we do church, the simple truth is God loves you. He loves you with a love you and I will never understand. And people can let you down. Parents can let you down. Friends can let you down. Church can let you down. But I need to tell you, God's love will never let you down. God's love never fails. The greatest display of love was shown when a sinless, perfect Savior endured the punishment meant for us. After he had been beaten, mocked, tortured, and nailed to a cross, scripture tells us, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. The savior of the world, buried in a grave, but he didn't stay dead. As dawn broke on the third day, a radiant light filled the grave where Jesus lay. The heavy stone sealing the entrance was rolled away, revealing an empty grave. The angels revealed, he is not here. He has risen. 
The earth trembled with the power of resurrection as the once lifeless body of Jesus emerged victorious over death. Jesus radiated hope and victory, forever changing the course of humanity. Because Jesus rose from the grave, there's no grave that can ever hold you. Because Jesus conquered death, death no longer has authority over you. Because Jesus is victorious, you can experience victory. Because Jesus is alive, you and I have life. standing I'm almost done because Jesus rose from the grave you can rise from any grave you know in the 1700s the fear of being buried alive was so prominent people were scared of it ever happening they were scared of being buried alive so people wanted to prevent it so safety coffins were invented and the earliest design of a safety coffin included a person being buried with a bell. They'd have a little string attached to that bell. And all that person would do is if they couldn't get out, if they couldn't scream, if they couldn't break free, they could ring that bell and someone would hear it and rescue them. So if you could ring that bell, if you could be unable to break out, be unable to break free, but if you could just... That sound meant there's life. My question to you, what has the enemy tried to bury you in? What area of your life you think is dead? See, you came here tonight to just have fun with your boys, but you're putting on a front because really you're hurting. And bitterness has taken root in your life. But I wanna tell you, love doesn't have to die in your life. There's still life even for you. Anxiety doesn't have to have authority over you any longer. That grave of depression that you think is final. I need to tell somebody, you still have purpose. How do I know that? Because you're here, you're watching, you're living, you're breathing, and if you have breath, God still has plans for you. Whatever the enemy has stolen, if he's stolen joy, if he's stolen peace, the Bible not only says that he has to return, but he has to return back sevenfold. So if you've lost joy, you don't just get joy back, you get seven times joy. 
you don't just get peace back. You get seven times peace. Peace. You don't. You don't get freedom back. You get seven times freedom. Jesus still empties graves. <laughs>